definitely make sure that happens here tonight is that I'm gonna make sure that not only the people in the room here tonight that are not natives of Hawaii but the people around the world find out things about Hawaii you never knew first things first the proper pronunciation is Hawaii Just so the world gets to hear it right at least once. And believe me, I understand exactly how you feel. I totally get it. For me, it's not Mexico, it's Mexico. I'm with you. Whenever people come to the island, you know, there's certain things people like to do, aside from the surfing or the, you know, the hiking or the, you know, the traditional things. People always see the, the, the movies and the one thing that always stands out is the luau. People always see the luau. You always see the guy with the fire. You know, he comes out and he makes a stance and you know. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, that looks cool. I want to let you guys know how you can tell if you're about to have a real, genuine experience versus some of the more diluted things that have happened here on the island. Let me explain. If you're going to go for a luau, make sure you do some research, okay? Don't just go to any luau. I'm going to tell you how you can tell if you're on a bad one. There's always a bus involved that takes you from the hotel to the luau. That's a given. When you get on the bus, there's a driver and there's always the person that's the host. If the host gets on the bus and you hear this. Hello and aloha, everyone. <laughs> Welcome aboard the King Kamehameha Luau Experience. <laughs> My name is Reagan. I am not a native of Hawaii. I'm actually from Oregon. <laughs> But I have been living here now for three weeks and you only need a few days and <laughs> you're basically a native. We're gonna have such a great time. It's gonna take us exactly 35 minutes to get from here to our destination. I've timed it all week, don't even worry about it. <laughs> this is our driver, his name is Taka. Taka's been here on the island for over 75 years. <laughs> He is so hardcore. He has taken a liking to me. He says I remind him of his daughter. He's so sweet. He calls me his little punani. He is so nice. So nice. to do some research to find out the type of conditions we're gonna have today. And there is a slight chance of rain. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Uh, what happens if it rains? You have nothing to worry about. I took the liberty of stopping off at an ABC store and purchasing some umbrellas <laughs> and some ponchos. So we're covered. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Are we gonna stop somewhere to get something to eat maybe or get some, some, some film? Absolutely, you have nothing to worry about. It's gonna be the best time ever. <laughs> Stay away from that door. <laughs> this is how you know when you're on a real Lua experience. The driver, you know, is there, the bus, and then the guy gets on and you hear this. <laughs> All right, everybody, hey, hey, brother, turn it down. <laughs> turn it down, brother.
All right, everybody, I'd like to welcome you aboard as we're going to Jermaine's Luau, okay? <laughs> My name is, uh, is Reno. You can call me Cousin Reno, I know. Uh, but don't worry, I'm not your real cousin, so don't ask for money, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're going to have a really good time today. It's going to be a great day here on the island. It's going to be beautiful. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Uh, how long is it going to take for us to get to the luau? Uh, actually, brother, he's going to, um, we're going to get there Hawaiian time. <laughs> what does Hawaiian time mean? <laughs> it means we get there when we get there. <laughs> Pardon me, I have another question. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I understand it's gonna rain today. What happens if it rains? <laughs> oh, you gonna get wet. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. Yeah. Are we gonna stop somewhere to get something to eat or get some fill? Hey, sit down, my hole. Are you talking to me? Hey, Mary. I'm talking to your brother. Sit down. And for the rest of the bus is wondering what Mahu is. It means he really likes coconuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <it was. laughs> With time and many, you know, coming here year after year and talking to people, certain words I've picked up, certain things I've learned. Um, I finally figured out what shoots means. Anyone that gets to come here to the island, you'll hear people saying that, shoots, and I found that it means yes. <laughs> because, you know, because Mexicans, we have our own slang words too. We, you know, you've heard me, orale, which is a term of excitement. It's also, it's like shoots, means yes. But you should have heard the conversation I had. This guy was trying to explain it to me. I go, how come, I keep hearing people say shoots, what's going on? Okay, brother, let me break it down for you, all right? Uh, shoots is, uh, is like saying yes. Ah, oh, okay, cool. All right. So uh, let me see. Um, uh, so somebody says, uh, you want to go to the store? And I say, shoots. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> Roger that? <laughs> what does that mean? It means yes. <laughs> So shoots means yes, and Roger that means yes. Roger that. How would you, I mean, is there one that you use for one thing versus one that you use for another? Can you give me an example? No problem, brother. Check it out. Somebody tell me, hey, bro, you want to go get a drink? Shoots. Hey, bro, you want to go titty ball? Roger that. <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I figured it out. And by the way, for all the people here on the island tonight that are not native, who are extremely light complected. <laughs> Basically for the white people. Um, I just wanna let you know, when you're here in Hawaii, if you hear this word, howly, they're talking about you. Howley is the word to describe white people. And it's not derogatory. I, I, I ask questions and it's not. It's just that, you know, and I ask one guy, I said, where did Howley come from? You know, and then one guy said, well, bro, I think many years ago, uh, some white people come here, right? They got drunk and they start yelling, you know, yee-haw! Say, hey, someone need to take down that Howley right there. <laughs> it's stuck. I'm trying to figure out Howley, all right? <laughs> But anyways, you guys, we've been traveling so many places. We've probably been in about 14 countries in the last two months. Yeah. Uh-huh. Shoot. We're like herpes. We go everywhere. Twice a year. Anyway, um... <laughs> that's bad, I know, right? You guys are so close, man. Like, if I slip, that's it. His show was in 
ID, but it hurt. It was terrible. It was terrible. So I gotta tell you, when we first kicked off our world tour, we started in, uh, we started in Singapore. And for me, that kind of threw me off because just to let you guys know, they do speak English in Singapore. It's actually the number one language spoken. And I didn't know that. And some people are like, well, why would you go to Singapore to perform if you didn't know whether or not they understood you? Because <laughs> the check was bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm a little whore. So, yeah. The only thing with Singapore is that Singapore, the rules over there are very strict. Like uh, many years ago, an American went over there and he was graffitiing on a wall, okay? He tagged up a wall and they got him. And they don't give out tickets in Singapore. The penalty for that was they pulled him aside, took off his shirt and they caned him with a stick. And there's no set number like, oh, you graffiti a wall with two letters, that's four licks. No, the guy hits you until he feels you've learned a lesson. <laughs> yeah, that's hardcore. If you're caught smuggling drugs into Singapore, the penalty is death. Which makes somebody like myself nervous when you travel with the people that you travel with. <laughs> Marty! Oh yeah. And you know it's crazy because they play a video when you're going through customs. As you're going through customs, they play a video to let you know where you're about to go into. And it starts off really nice. It starts off sweet. It's like, Doo -doo -doo -doo. welcome to Singapore. <laughs> Singapore, very beautiful country. Very nice country. Very clean country. If you are caught smuggling drugs into our country. I stab you. I told you. I knocked you on the ground. I swat over you. I pee on you while doing gangnam style. I do that like that. And I kick you and kill you. Enjoy Singapore. <laughs> From Singapore, we got to go up to uh, London, England to do some shows, and it was pretty cool over there. Obviously, they spoke English. Um, the only issues that I had in London, England were that over there, they drive on the opposite side of the street. And that is very, you know, that's, that's kind of challenging for tourists because when you're crossing a street, you're automatically conditioned to come out, look left, Look right, look left again, and then you cross. And so when you're there, you have to retrain yourself because you'll come out and you think you're cool. Look, there's no cars coming, let's go. <laughs> Every other block is like the movie Final Destination. You know what I mean? And over there, they got double-decker buses. Those suckers are heavy. You get hit by one of those at 30 miles an hour, uh, you know? At least if you get hit by a bus here on the island, you have so much of a chance. First of all, nobody's in a hurry. You get hit by a bus here and you're like, huh? Hey, bro. Walk it off. Are you okay? Shoots. All right. I've been to the news station here. I've been on the news many times and they're always, you know, people always step off the curb, they're not paying attention, they're looking at the buildings or they're taking pictures and you know, huh? You know, and they report them, you know, a, a man was struck by a bus here today. Uh, his leg was broken. Doctors say he will be okay. London, England getting hit by a double-decker bus going 30? <laughs> a man exploded today <laughs> when he was struck by a double-decker bus. We have video footage. Some of the places we're planning on performing this next year, um, we're talking about going to Germany, we're talking about going to Bulgaria, and India. India's on the list of new places we're gonna visit. And I'm excited about India, you know, when I was telling people in England that we're going to, you know, to India, I had Indian people telling me, Oh, they're, they're, it's going to be amazing when you go there. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to love it. It's amazing. And I just stare. And the guy goes, why are you staring? I go, because your voice doesn't match the... <laughs> oh, you think we all sound like... I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I live in America. Indians over there, keep it real. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> 
And I have nothing but love and respect for Indian people. I'm going to tell you something right now. Indian people in the United States are the hardest working people I have ever seen. And that's coming from a Mexican, okay? And I'll tell you why I say this. You will never see an Indian person with a sign that says, we'll work for food in the United States. And you will never see an Indian person committing a crazy crime. Like, when was the last time you heard of Indians robbing a bank? <laughs> Look at everybody. Oh, I can't remember, bro. Because <laughs> it doesn't happen. First of all, Indian people are so nice and they're so sweet. I can't see it. You know, you're gonna rob a bank. You need authority. You need to come in there guns blazing. I said, get your ass on the ground now. I can't imagine. Would you please take the money? <laughs> I, why are you laughing? <laughs> I am talking to you. <laughs> Forget this. I'm out of here. I don't need this. <laughs> he gets in the car. His partner's waiting for him. Did you get the money? They would not give me the money. <laughs> Did you show them the gun? I showed them the gun! <laughs> we better leave, they're going to call the police. They're still laughing. <laughs> Where did you get the computer? They thought I was tech support. <laughs> it's too much fun, man. All these different countries, all these different places we've been going, and honestly, you guys, it's not possible without the love and the support of my family. They made that possible. Because I can't just go take off. You know, you really? Seriously? You know, you're just going to leave? It takes a strong woman, first of all, to put up with me. And it's not easy. Oh, you're going to go travel the world with this crazy guy named Martin who's got tattoos and issues? Have fun. Uh -uh. It's not easy, you guys. Like I said, it takes a lot of love and support from my family. And right now, it's a crazy time because my son is 15, okay? Some of you know I have a son from my last special. Uh, I talked about how he became a dad and, um, because he's, he's technically my stepson. And the only reason I'm saying that is because he's been in my life for eight years and he's 15. So I don't want you to look at me and the math is all wrong. And you're like, he's ghetto. I'm not ghetto. I just hooked up with a beautiful woman who had a pre-started family, which is why the math is off. Basically, I took over a lease is what happened. <laughs> and everything's been going great, but when he turned 15, it started changing. Like, he no longer talks to me, which is crazy. Not to say that he doesn't see me and acknowledge me, he just doesn't talk. And I thought it was personal, and his mom is like, no, he's going through a phase. Like, he doesn't speak. He makes sounds. Frankie, how's your day? Did you take out the trash? Ah! Like, wow. Like, the only person he talks to is at the other end of his phone. Because that's all he does. All day. Just text, 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 text. And it's funny because he's always like this, texting. And when he walks around, he takes little steps so that in case he bumps into something, it doesn't hurt. Like, he's like, like the little vacuum, you know? You, and then, you know, and then, you know? And when he's taking these little steps, he makes these sounds. <laughs> and his tongue comes out halfway. It looks freaky. <laughs> like he's trying to text with it. <laughs> and I asked his mom, is he okay? He's going through a phase. And I could totally understand my son standing in the corner for 15 minutes at his time with his tongue out making noises if he was a special circumstance. But he's not, okay? If he was, I'd hug him and love him the same, but he's not. He's a straight-A student in his school. He's at the top of the list in his class as one of the smartest kids. And it's, no, 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 don't, don't clap, don't clap. You know why? You know why? Because on paper, it says he's a genius. <laughs> but at home, <laughs> And don't get me wrong, you guys, I believe that good grades are important, okay? But you would think with all the different classes that they offer in school, how come they don't have a class called Common Sense? <laughs> you know what I mean? Make it the easiest class they have ever taken. Make it so easy that it's the exact same class every single day. They don't pay attention anyway. Make it the same. Hello, class. Welcome to Common Sense. Let us begin. Up, down, left, right, hot, cold, take a shower, take a shower, take a 
shower! I don't know what happened when he turned 15. He forgot how to play with water. Oh my God, and for me, you guys, smell is so important. It is so important. You know how many people I meet every single year? I am so self-conscious. I don't want anyone to smell me that I meet and all of a sudden have them say, fluffy smell like ass. <laughs> Hell no. I know I'm a big guy. That's why I do double the maintenance. Twice the showers, twice the cologne, twice the deodorant, twice the powder. If I fart right now, this whole area will smell like cinnamon. That's how I roll. <laughs> like I said, you guys, for me, smell is so important. You know, and the fact that my son at 15 now is, is, is you know, he's, his body's becoming an adult, even though he's, <laughs> you know, and I try to tell him, and he always forgets, and blah, 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 and it wasn't until his PE teacher called us up and told us that what he was doing is he's leaving his PE shirt in the locker over the weekend instead of bringing it home to wash. And so that shirt just broils and simmers in those kid juices. And then on Monday when he puts it on, it's all hard and yellow and just, you know, <laughs> nasty. And they told us, your son is smelly. And I'm like, oh, hell no. I took his ass to the store and I bought him a 10 pack of that right guard gel with a little click on the bottom. And I showed him, Frankie, look, 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 right there, right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. Every day, twice a day, that's what you gotta do. And every day it's an issue. Did you put on deodorant? <sighs> I went back to the store and I bought 10 more. And I came back to the house and I started strategically placing them all over the house. One in the front door, one at the back door, one in the hallway, one in the kitchen. So no matter where he's at, hit it! He hated that because the neighbors would come over the house and I'd have to explain why there's deodorant everywhere like it's a new type of potpourri. <laughs> and then he starts hiding the deodorant and then he starts lying about it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but teenagers can't lie. They're too fidgety, they're uncoordinated, they look away, they stutter, you know? they can't focus. I asked him, did you put on deodorant? Mm hmm? Are you sure? Yeah. Come here. I'm gonna smell you. You don't believe me? No. That sucks. <laughs> Are you wearing the gel deodorant that I bought for you? All right, take your finger, stick it under your armpit, and then pull it out. Why? Because if you're wearing the gel deodorant that I bought for you, when you pull your finger out of your armpit, your finger's gonna be shiny. It's gonna look like you have lubricant on it. What's that? Shut up. And then he tells me, I'm wearing dry deodorant. Oh, really? I don't remember buying that. And I got in his face and I said, look, Frankie, you don't have to lie. I'm here to help you. I'm not here to hurt you. I said, do you like girls? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, guess what? They don't like it when you smell. <laughs> they like it when you smell fresh and clean. You don't have to lie. I'm going to let this go. But if I catch you lying to me again, that's when he freaked me out and he did this. What? In my head, I heard, are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it on. And I'm not a violent person, bro. I'm not violent, but hey, it's kill or be killed, right? You know? And, and seriously, you guys, I would never put my hands on my son. And people judge me for that. Oh, you wouldn't hit your kid? You think he's gonna call the cops? I don't care if he calls the cops. I'll call the cops. Anyone who's ever seen my specials knows I've had a few run-ins with law enforcement. <laughs> yeah, and because of one joke where I went to a Krispy Kreme drive-thru, are you kidding me? <laughs> I have become law enforcement's favorite comedian. In the state of California alone, I've done over 50 shows for the California Highway Patrol, Los Angeles Police Department, Long Beach Police Department, where I live. I can call a cop right now to go to my house and hold down my son while my girlfriend kicks him. <laughs> That's how connected I am. I'm not worried about him calling the cops. I'm worried about him calling TMZ. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> oh, yeah. TMZ finds out I beat my son? Are you kidding me? They'll have me on TV the next day. Uh-oh, looks like chocolate cake isn't the only thing he beats up. <laughs> so
So I told my girl what happened. I said, listen, baby, he's lying to me and he's chesting up. I don't want to have to get physical with him, but I will if I have to. I'm not going anywhere. And see, my girlfriend's different. My girlfriend will actually choke him. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. She's a little ghetto. <laughs> kind of hot <laughs> oh man I left town for two weeks to go do some shows and when I came home it was night and day they picked me up at the airport he jumps out of the car and he's holding the door open like he's valet and I get in the car I look at my girl what's going on he thinks you're still mad at him so he's being extra good we're gonna ride this out And the whole drive home, he's doing that little song in the back seat. I'm gonna clean my room, I'm gonna take out the trash, I'm gonna walk the dog, I'm gonna do the dishes. And when we got home, he did all of it. And I was like, wow. And then we're passing each other in the hallway. And as we're passing each other, he sticks out his arm, bro. And he tapped me. And he keeps walking and I go, excuse you. And he goes, whatever. <laughs> oh, oh, boy, let me take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a decent person. I'm not great, I'm not horrible, I'm decent, okay? Anybody who's ever met me in the past or will meet me in the future, you know what I'm saying? Hey, I know what's in my heart. I'm a nice person. And if I'm being nice to you and you're mean to me, I'll still be nice. But if you're mean to me a second time, I don't care who it is. I could be one of you guys. It could be one of my friends in the back or it could be the new dependent on my taxes. You mess with me, I'm going to mess with you back, and I'm going to step it up a notch so you don't forget. Everybody's quiet. All the kids are like, I don't want to meet him now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. Next morning, I was in my son's room, and I'm standing over his bed. It's 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'm just watching him sleep. I know it looked creepy like the movie. <laughs> And I'm just thinking, what am I going to do to get even, right? And I look over and I see his alarm clock. And I'm like, perfect. Just so you guys understand, it's his job to wake himself up for school. And he knows if he's late because he didn't set that clock, his mom is going to have his ass. He's afraid of his mom for good reason. So I grab that clock and I change the time from 5 a.m. to 7.30. It gets better. Then I set it off. And I grabbed him. And he wakes up all scared. Ah, 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 ah. Look, look, you overslept. Hey, look, you overslept. And he freaked out. Ah, ah. Shh. I'm gonna help you. And I started handing him his clothes. Here, get dressed, get dressed, put your clothes. He's getting dressed in the dark. He looks like a little drunk. Your deodorant. And I grab him and I drag his ass into the garage. His whole face is oily and sweaty. He's got rocks and crust in his eyes. He has a perfect white line going all the way to the back of his neck. As soon as I get him in the car, falls asleep. I jump in and I take him to school. We get to his school. The sun is barely coming out. There is not a kid for miles. As soon as we get by the office, I slammed on the brakes to wake him up. And he wait, oh, Frankie, the bell just rang, hurry. The last kid went in, you're gonna make it, go, go, hurry, go. Oh, okay, thank you, all right, I love you. It was Sunday. Kid mess with you, you mess with kid. <laughs> now I know a lot of you right now are like, oh, you went back to get him, right? That wasn't the plan. <laughs> he starts calling my phone. And freaking, him. <laughs> I look at the phone and it's an old picture when he was still cute, you know? <laughs> I sent him the voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> look at the phone and I see his mom's face. I'm like, shit! <laughs> Little traitor! <laughs> We're trying to play it off in the car. <laughs> Hello? Pick him up. 
I can barely hear you. Pick him up! <laughs> I get back to the school, big old freaking school with one kid in front of it. <laughs> I found something out that week. I found out that you don't have to yell at a kid to get your point across. You definitely don't have to hit one. All you really have to do to make sure they never forget the day that they messed up is embarrass them. <laughs> Embarrassing a kid is the biggest weapon you can have as a parent that's legal. <laughs> and so much more effective, you guys. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, between the ages of 10 and 19, it's all about image. It's all about, do I have the cool shirt, the cool hat, the cool uh, wristband, the cool watch, the cool glasses, the cool shoes, the cool pants. They wanna fit in so bad. You mess with their image at school, oh, it's mental, it's emotional. And depending on what you did, it's physical. <laughs> Why do you think they make such a big deal about bullying in schools and child abuse amongst each other? Because when kids turn, it's not pretty, especially if they have a reason to, like finding out that you got dropped off on Sunday by your dad because there was a janitor there working who saw the whole thing go down. <laughs> And three days is what it took for word to get out. And when those kids found out it was my son, the things they said to him were so bad that when he came home, he was in tears, okay? And I'm not gonna lie, you guys, I felt terrible for like a second. <laughs> it was bad though, it was. I was moved, he came in all hard. <laughs> oh, baby! Oh, you're happy. All day long, people have been messing with me. It's Sunday, kid. It's Sunday, kid. Get him a calendar. Get him a watch. Why are you just standing there? Say something. Put on deodorant. I'm not gonna lie, you guys, I think deep down he wishes that I would hit him because it would be faster. <laughs> but that's not how I roll. Mm -mm. Oh no. And I gotta give credit to his mom, you guys. His mom allows me to be a dad. You know, as a step parent, it's not easy. You can't just come in and, and run things, it takes time. If you come into that house and you start trying to yell at people and start trying to, mm -mm -mm, no, they'll jump all over you. You can't be doing that. Don't go, hey, you tell me what he did. I'll handle it. You don't do anything. <laughs> yeah, a few of you are like, oh, I've been there, bro. <laughs> yeah, all right? Next thing you know, you're in the corner crying when that kid is supposed to be. <laughs> it's a hazing process in the beginning. It's, everybody's pushing each other's buttons. Everybody's testing each other. Is this guy really going to stick around? That's what happens. And after eight years, hey, my credit is good. <laughs> so my girl backs me up. Whenever I make a call, she backs me up. Don't get me wrong. If I make a, a bad call, She's gonna call me on it, okay? If I mess up, she's gonna point it out. She doesn't think that all my ideas are good ones. And there's been a few times when I've messed up as a dad. Like one night, uh, <laughs> I got really, really drunk on the road with Martin. And I don't know what happened, I started drunk texting Frankie. I don't know what it is about me getting drunk, for some reason the phone just <laughs> And my girl found out about it. And when I got home, I knew something was up because she called me by my first name. And we haven't used first names in years. You know, since then, it's always been pet names. You know how it goes, you know? Honey, baby, sweetie, sucia, something to kind of just... <laughs> Some of you got that? Gracias. Anyway, I walk in the door and I hear Gabriel. And I'm like, oh, I'm in court. <laughs> and here she comes out of the back. I understand when you're out there, you're gonna do what you're gonna do. You wanna get drunk? Fine, get drunk. You wanna text me while you're drunk? Fine, text me while you're drunk. Do not ever drunk text my son again. How do you know I was drunk? Really? <laughs> Frankie, come here. Bring your phone. <laughs> Look at this message that came in at 4.17 a.m. Put on deodorant, fucker. That's a nickname. 
I gotta give her credit. Anytime I mess up, she is very creative on how she approaches me. Like the latest thing that she does is she no longer wants to deal with me face to face. What she does is she will find one of the three dogs that we have in the house and she will start carrying a full blown conversation with the dog, telling the dog what I'm doing wrong as a man. <laughs> you have to understand how demeaning this is to me, okay? I own chihuahuas. <laughs> and you mean to tell me two pounds of terror is gonna take over oh. me? Uh -uh. No, 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 no. And I'll tell you what happened, you guys. I was actually innocent. I was actually innocent. I didn't do anything bad, but it looked bad. I had three shows one night. And after the third show, I was exhausted. So I go in the back to lay down for a little bit, and I fell asleep. And I woke up, and it was four hours later. And I reached down, and I pull out my phone. My phone was still in my pocket, and it was in silent mode. And I look at the screen, and the screen said 27 missed calls. From? <laughs> I wonder who. <laughs> There is not a text in the world that's going to fix that. There's not a phone call that I'm going to make at 4 o'clock in the morning that's going to make this better. I'm screwed no matter what. So I shut off my phone. <laughs> yeah, look at all the girls are like, that's where you really messed up. <laughs> I know. I didn't know you could die twice. Apparently you can't. So I come home, you guys, and I'm, I know I'm innocent, so I'm not showing up at the front door with flowers or trying to be, oh, no, 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 I know I'm good. So I show up confident. I walk in, I said, baby, let me just explain what happened to me this weekend before you say anything. And then she starts, oh, look who's here, Bruno, look who's here. Daddy's home. Now daddy wants to talk to us. Funny, talk to Bruno. Let me explain. He thinks we're playing, huh? Really? You're not gonna talk to me? You're gonna talk to the dog? Somebody's getting frustrated, huh? Kinda like we were frustrated when he didn't pick up his phone. Yes, he did. <laughs> she will not look at me. She will not talk to me. She continues to do this for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, she has me doing it. Bruno, tell her I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Bru Bruno! Bruno! Now she thinks I'm making fun of her. Are you mocking me? Now I'm pissed off because now she's screaming in my face. So then I was like, oh, she thinks we're mocking her, huh, Bruno? <laughs> Mommy shouldn't have played this game because we can play it better, huh? Yeah, because I can make you talk back to me, huh? Yes, I can, Bubba. Yes, I can. Because you love me more. I love her. Mommy's crazy, huh? This is a bitch. Come on. And that started a whole different argument. <laughs> my God, you guys. And I don't want you thinking that my girlfriend's a bad person. She's an amazing woman. The fact that I only have seven stories about her in eight years says a lot. You know, don't get me wrong, five of them happened this year. But that's still way below the bar, you know what I'm saying? And I get questions. I get questions about her because, you know, in the past I've done specials and I've talked about other people in my life. I've talked about my mom, I've talked about my dad, I've talked about my sisters, my brother, I've talked about Frankie, but I've never really talked about my girl. And so I get people that ask me, you know, we want to know a little bit more. First question that everybody always asks is, is your girlfriend fluffy too? <laughs> and no, she's not. She's a little bit curvy, but she's not fluffy. And it's not to say that I have anything against big women. Most of my ex-girlfriends were really big girls. When we would hug, it was like arms and pillows. <laughs> oh yeah, it was that Tempur-Pedic love, you know what I'm saying? It was hardcore, like we would hug really, really hard and then let go and then our body would come back to normal. <laughs> Another question that people ask is, uh, is your girlfriend also Mexican? You know, is your girlfriend Mexican? And yes, she is, but that doesn't mean anything because I have dated the rainbow, okay? That's just where it landed, you know? I just, you know. Oh, look. It's just where it landed, all right? You know, uh, the, the crazy part with my girl is that she doesn't have traditional Mexican features, all right? She could pass for white, which is funny because the... Uh, First time I introduced her to my mom, it was quite the show. 
I take my girl to go meet my mom for the first time, and uh, you know, my mom, she she would come to the door. She would come to the door if you know, she, you know, she sees you pulling up in the driveway. She opens the door and just waits for you to get there and greets you at the door. So I'm pulling up, right? Gets to, you know, she comes to the door and she sees me opening the door, and this white girl comes out, right? <laughs> and she starts cussing me out from the door. Saca ese cabrona de aquí. Qué chingados andas haciendo con esa güera? Sácame esa güera. Get that white girl pa allá. Saca la white girl pa allá. And my girl speaks Spanish, so my girl looks at my mom and she's like, Hola, señora, ¿cómo estás? And my mom was like, Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh, I'm so sorry! Ah, like, uh, you see that, ma? You see that, ma? They make them in that color, too. <laughs> Another question that I get about my girl is, uh, How did you guys meet? Did you meet at a show? And actually, no, we didn't meet at a show. We met at a bar. And see, some of you are like, oh, I don't know about that one. Yeah. A lot of people don't like that one. They're like, oh, really? A bar? That's not a good way to meet someone. No, <laughs> it's an honest way to meet someone. <laughs> we were both drunk when we met, <laughs> which I find ironic considering she has issues with me drinking now. You know, eight years later, the way I see it, I'm just keeping it real. You know what I'm saying, man? <laughs> but no, she don't see it that way. When we met, I was gone, she was gone. We started talking to each other, and at the end of the night, I was like, wow, you have issues. <laughs> You're messed up too. We went to go get a bite to eat, and then, you know, nine months later, we moved in together. And that, it worked out for us. You know, I tell people, you want to find out who you're with? Don't just rush into the relationship right away. Like you see some of those people, after a month, we knew it was meant to be. <laughs> yeah, a year later, he changed. She's not the same. He changed. She's not the same. He changed. Not the same. People don't change. I'll tell you why it looks like they do. Because in the beginning of the relationship, you do whatever you have to do to make it work. And the first thing you do is you bite your tongue. All of your freaking issues and things that bother you, you check your own morals because you want to make it work. You start weighing out the pros and the cons. You're like, oh man, she talks a lot, but look at that butt. You're like, oh man, her family's kind of crazy, but they got money. You know, so you start weighing things out. That's why it looks like the person changed a year later. And I'm just saying, you guys, if you don't feel like investing a lifetime trying to figure out who you're with, just do what I did and get drunk with the person. But don't just get drunk to get drunk. Get drunk with the intent on getting as much real information out of them so that you can make an educated decision on whether or not to be with them. Make it fun. Make it a game. This is what you don't know. This is what you do. You sit across from each other. You make a list of five things you have to know before you become exclusive. Then you break open a bottle of tequila or alcohol of your choice. You do 10 shots each. You wait 35 minutes. You turn on a flip cam, hit record, and let the date begin. <laughs> you're about to find out who you're really dealing with. Make it fun. Okay, Jennifer, um, you go first. Thank you, Jonathan, thank you. Okay, question one. How many... <laughs> okay, question one. How many people have you slept with? And guys can lie, but the face gives it away. How many? Have you ever cheated? <laughs> no. Next day, you pull out that video and you confront them. And you can see for yourself who you're really dealing with. And if you can see that they're lying, call them out. Jonathan, this is the saddest thing I've ever seen. It is so obvious that you're lying. There's no way in hell I'm ever going to be with you. Why don't you just be a man and tell the truth? How many people have you really been with? Oh, man, uh, over 20. Over 20? Have you ever cheated? Oh, God, I cheated on everybody. How could you do that? How could you cheat? How could you cheat? <laughs> I was molested. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Is some of your clapping, some are laughing, some are like, it's still not funny. <laughs> I'm not making fun of molestation, I'm only making fun of the fact that <laughs> Alfred said it. <laughs> it's all tense now, huh? Some people are over there, now they gotta go pee. Go ahead, go ahead, go pee, go ahead. <laughs> They're freaking out. <laughs> Hello, I'm not TV, I'm right here. I told the venue too, I said, you know what they gotta do for the special? They gotta put speakers in the bathroom under the toilets. So when people get up like that to go pee, I can mess them up and go, Welcome to the restroom. If you need to go pee pee, please use stall number one. If you need to go po po, please use stall number two. Thank you. Bienvenidos al baño. Si necesitas hacer pipí, usa el cuarto número uno. Si necesitas hacer caca, usa el cuarto número dos. Gracias. Equal opportunity, right? Yeah. Welcome to the restroom. Hell yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you need to pee, you stall number one. If you need to shit, take your nasty ass home. Some of you are laughing, some of you are like, stop doing those voices. <laughs> Just having fun, that's all. I gotta tell you guys, being a comedian has been the, uh, one of the greatest experiences for me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, been a, it's been a fun ride. It's been a fun ride, and um, a lot of people don't understand what has gone into this. You know, uh, me personally, I, I got a lot of people to thank. My family, obviously, first and foremost, and all my friends and all the support and all the people you don't see that are behind the scenes that have helped me. You know, there's a lot of comedians out there. They do really good, and for some reason, they start, you know, going crazy and things happen. And then what happened? <laughs> Wrong people around them. So whenever you see me, you're like, oh, Gabriel's keeping it together because people keep me together. <laughs> I start believing my own hype. I'm at 7-Eleven. Yeah, give me all that shit. Yeah, yeah. Give me a slurpee. Give me crazy. <laughs> Why is he talking to me like that? I don't know, just, you know. I just want you guys to know. <laughs> it's been a fun ride, and I, I want you to understand a little bit more of what has happened over the years to get to this point. For the first, I'd say the first 10 years of my career, I was considered a Southwest comedian by promoters, meaning that they would only promote me in California, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, you know, New Mexico. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing is that they were calling me a Southwest comedian and then they call me Latino comedian. And I hated that. No, no woo, I hate that. <laughs> I'll tell you why. And I know you have good intentions when you woo. Let me explain why I don't like that title. When you say Latino comedian, it makes it sound like I can only perform for Latinos, okay? And don't get me wrong, I know who I am and where I come from, but I believe that Latinos should be shared with everyone. And I, that's what I'm trying to do. And the reason why I make a big deal about that is because anybody else, you just call them their name. For example, Jerry Seinfeld. He's just Jerry Seinfeld. He's not Jewish comedian Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> Chris Rock is just Chris Rock. He's not African-American comedian Chris Rock. But with me, I was always Latino comedian or fat comic. Yeah, they wouldn't even call me Fluffy, those bastards. <laughs> And so it wasn't until years and years of grinding it out that eventually I wound up meeting a promoter who eventually became my manager who took a chance on me. And he promoted me in Minneapolis, Minnesota, okay? And you cannot get any whiter than Minneapolis, Minnesota. That is where the Howleys are built, okay? That is the Howley factory, okay? It's Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it was a venue about as big as this, and it was, uh, it was sold out. And word got back to Los Angeles and to New York and to all these promoters that there's this entertainer with the last name Iglesias who sold a bunch of tickets who was not Enrique. Next thing you know, promoters are coming out the woodwork. Now they're changing their tune. Now they're not calling me Latino comedian anymore. Now they're saying, oh, this guy's, he's funny across the board. He's crossover. He's so crossover. His material touches everyone. He's crossover. He's crossover. Really? You're going to call a Mexican crossover? It was getting worse. All I 
I wanted to do was be given a chance to go out and perform and show what I could do and not have restrictions <laughs> and titles and stuff put on. And it was very, very hard. And so, like I said, once I met my, uh, my, my buddy who took care of me and became my manager, Joe Malaj, who did amazing work, he started taking me everywhere. And with the help of him and my, my agent, uh, Matt Blake, and we wound up hitting all 50 states. Next thing I know, we go to Canada. Next thing I know, they sent me to Europe. Next thing I know, we hit Australia. And then I get this phone call. My agent calls me up and he says, Gabe, check it out. You're getting a request to perform in the Middle East. I go, really? Okay, cool. Army? Navy, Marines, Air Force, who? Actually, the request is coming from a prince. Run that by me again. A prince. I said, Purple Rain? <laughs> Not prince. A prince. I said, how do they know me? I, I, I don't know, but they say that they know you and they want to hire you. I go, it sounds like a joke, Matt. Trust me, it sounds legit. All right. If it's legit, I'll tell you what. Give whoever a ridiculous figure and let them know that they have to wire the money today. Otherwise, forget it. Four hours later, Gabe, what? Ridiculous just called. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm looking at the screen, bro. They wired all of it. Next thing I know. <sighs> Welcome aboard Saudi Arabian Airlines. <laughs> Seventeen hour flight you guys from Detroit, Michigan to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia and just so you guys know I didn't go by myself. Okay. I took some friends with me Nobody from this show <laughs> For obvious reasons yeah, man, you see the crew that I travel with, everybody's hairy, big nose, goatee, beard, crazy eyes, this. Are you kidding me? With the, all of us, we're like Osama bin Lopez, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know what the hell we are. So I took two other friends. I took one friend, his name is Edwin San Juan, who's Filipino, works clean. <laughs> hell yeah. And another buddy of mine named Larry Omaha, who's Native American, who also works clean. And... Uh, all right, so hell yeah, sure. <laughs> Hold on, I want to look at the camera. Hey, Larry Omaha, Edwin San Juan, you guys have fans and they're here in Hawaii. Get your asses over here. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we head to Riyadh, 17 hour flight from Detroit. As soon as we get there, they flew us to first class, by the way. It was really nice. And the plane is pulling up to the gate, and you know, it's doing the whole, you know, and the tube is coming out to meet the plane. As soon as the tube touches the plane, all of a sudden, the door on the opposite side of the plane, pops open and a man in a suit gets on and he walks over to the three of us and he does this and I'm sitting there freaking out like oh my god this is like the movies <laughs> and they pulled us off the plane and they escorted us to this area called VIP baggage claim and it sounds kind of crazy VIP and I get there and I realize oh they're, they're serving cookies and candy and coffee and there's leather sofas and it's really nice and there's nothing but Middle Eastern businessmen there, okay? And they're all talking about me. I don't understand Arabic, but everyone in this room understands when someone's talking about you. The guy's looking at me and he's like, I'm sorry, but this is universal. And apparently this is Arabic for day. So then this other guy walks over to me and he's holding a sign and the sign has my name on it and he's really excited. He's like, it is you, come, 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 it is you, come, come, come we go. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So we grab our luggage and we follow him outside to the curb. They have three Lincoln Navigator SUVs waiting for us. There's three comedians and there's three cars. We're so paranoid that we're in the Middle East, we all get in one car. <laughs> we're sitting in there. <laughs> We're heading towards downtown Riyadh, okay? Now, all I know up to this point about my experience is that I've already been paid, my flight's been taken care of, and I have a point person who I'm supposed to meet at the airport who's not there. So I'm talking to the driver. I said, excuse me, sir, where's, where's, where's this guy? It is okay. Hey, take it to him. It's, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, uh, okay. And for me, it's not okay because I researched Saudi Arabia, and, you know, you think the rules in Singapore are strict. <laughs> 
The rules in Saudi Arabia are very, very different, okay? And I don't want to offend anyone, and I want to make sure that I don't say the wrong thing. So I need to know, you know, some, some, I need some info. So I keep talking to the driver. I said, um, sir, would you mind helping me with some questions? Whatever you need, you ask, I tell you. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Um, I apologize in advance if I come across rude or disrespectful or ignorant, but um, how do you guys know about me here in the Middle East? What do you mean, how do we know? Yeah, how do you know that I'm a comedian? Do you have Comedy Central or HBO or Showtime? What is that? That's a no. That's what that is, that's a no. Um, how do you know that I'm an entertainer? Oh, your videos, YouTube. My friend, YouTube, you're huge. You're the number two most famous comedian in all of the Middle East. Number two. You're kidding. I am not comedian, I don't kid. No. I'm the number two most famous comedian in all of the Middle East? Yes! Who's number one? Jeff Dunham. <laughs> Jeff Dunham is the number one comedian in the Middle East? You guys don't find him at all offensive? Oh, <gasps> no! <laughs> I kill you! When I heard that, you guys, I was like, you know what? They get it. They get it. So I'm like, we're cool. We're sitting, we're driving, we're heading towards downtown. All of a sudden, the driver cuts the wheel really hard and we get off the freeway and now we're taking a side road going away from the city. And I'm like, um, excuse me, where are we going? We're going to the show. I go, um, it says here that we're staying in the city. Yes, you're staying in the city, but the show is somewhere else. That doesn't make sense. Why would you have the show somewhere else? How come you don't have it in the city? And then he broke it down. My friend, here in Riyadh, it is very different, okay? Uh, your type of entertainment is forbidden in the city. There are people called religious police that hold up the uh, traditions. They keep it so that it's very traditional. It is not allowed. The social gathering is a no-no. We must go somewhere secret in the desert. Uh, all right, um, so how many people are you guys expecting in, at the show? Easily between seven to eight hundred people. That many? I told you, number two. <laughs> and sure enough, you guys, we pull up to this racetrack in the middle of the desert, and there's, uh, there's a giant tent set up next to it, and there's, there's 800 people, roughly, there for a comedy show. And as soon as we pull up, as soon as we pull up, <laughs> radios start popping out. Just very... <laughs> And I keep hearing on all the radios. Fluffy. 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 All of a sudden, some guy runs up on the stage and they hand him a microphone. And he starts yelling to the crowd. I don't know what he's saying, but I've seen enough hip-hop to recognize a hype man. Oh yeah, he's out there. And then I get the biggest introduction of my life. And now, direct from the United States of America, here he is, Gabriel Iglesias. And the crowd starts going, fluffy, fluffy, fluffy. And when I heard that, I freaked out. I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be an amazing show. So I ran to the stage as fast as I could. I'm not a runner. I booked it to the stage, you guys, because I was so excited. And when I got to the front, it clicked that in Saudi Arabia, they still have segregation. And I didn't find out till the last second because I saw a line going down the middle. And on one side, men. Other side, women. And all the women in the front row were covered from head to toe. All I saw was this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had no idea I was performing for Assassin's Creed. I didn't know that. <laughs> It threw me off so bad. Give it Iglesias! And I, hey, what's going on, everybody? How you? <laughs> I froze. 
I've been doing this for 15 years. I don't freeze, but that threw me off so bad. I didn't know what to say. All of a sudden, men start yelling my jokes at me. My friend, do the donkey, do the donkey. Hey, chocolate cake, chocolate cake. Guy in the front, make fun of me. Hell no. <laughs> and the people started laughing. The women were laughing just as hard as the men. You know, granted, some of them I couldn't see, but for the most part, it's like, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. You know, but they're, laughing, they're moving and laughing. I even had fun with one of the girls. I said, oh, I saw your neck. And she said, you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> the Saudis had such an amazing sense of humor. They were laughing and carrying on, and I had no idea they were going to be like that. And then after the show, I got a chance to meet some of the locals. And one guy was almost in tears. He was so emotional. He walks up to me, and he's just like... <laughs> I cannot believe that I am standing here in front of you, Mr. Fluffy. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Please, please, when you return to United States or wherever you travel, let the people know what you saw, okay? Let them know that we are not all bad, that we are not all those bad people from Fox News, okay? <laughs> You let them know, because we see Fox News, and Fox News believes that everybody in Middle East is bad. Everybody's terrorist. Everybody has a bomb. He has a bomb. He has a bomb. He has a bomb. Oprah is here giving away bombs to everybody. Everybody. <laughs> Please, you let them know. We are not all bad people, okay? We are not all terrorists. My cousin. Maybe. What? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Look at your face. Look at your face. Oh, I'm going to die. Look at you. A plane. What plane? I got you again. Two for two. I got you. He is raising my blood pressure every seven seconds. And then he starts breaking it down for me how stand up comedy is starting to bring people together in the Middle East. And how he's starting to, do, you know, he's doing comedy. It's, it was crazy, the conversation. You know, here in, the, in Saudi Arabia, um, uh, people, they, they like watching the, the stand-up comedy because uh, we love to laugh. Okay, we love to laugh. It's great to laugh. And uh, people don't think that the people in the Middle East have sense of humor. They, they see videos, they see TV, they think we are the same. They say, oh, in Middle Eastern people are all angry. Look at their face, they're angry. Everybody angry, everybody mad, everybody angry. My friend, we're not angry. It's hot. Okay, it's 117 degrees. Everybody is not mad, they're hot. Look at everybody has a hot face. Hot face. Everybody hot face. I promise you give me air conditioning. I am so happy. <laughs> we are okay. We love to laugh. I've been doing the stand-up comedy for uh, about uh, six months now, and um, I have jokes. Good for you. May I try? Oh, great. <laughs> All right, man, go ahead. Okay, very nervous, very nervous. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Two Jews walk into a bar. Not in my country. <laughs> We wound up doing shows all over the Middle East. We were in uh, Riyadh, Bahrain, Dubai, Qatar, Doha, and each show, you guys, was more amazing than the last show. Not because there were so many people, but because the people were friendly. They were fun. They got all the references. I couldn't get over that. I honestly thought that they were gonna be like the people from Fox News. <laughs> and I felt terrible. I felt terrible because I was judging them. I was prejudging them, and I thought that they were going to be a certain way, and I felt bad because all those years people were doing that to me, not really giving me a chance, and I was over there doing the same thing. I felt so bad. And then when I met the prince, I was still judging, 19 years old, and he's a prince. I thought he was going to be a brat. He walks up to me, and I was already like, what's up? <laughs> I failed to realize that he's a prince, and he was brought up to be a prince. The way he carried himself, he intimidated me in about 18 seconds. Okay, I'm 36. And I'm, you know, what's up? And he's like... Jibril. Excuse me? Jibril. Jibril? Gabriel. 
I understand that your name is Gabriel, but in the Arabic language, your name is Jibril. I was welcoming you in our language. Oh! I'm a dick. And I started already imagining what was going to happen. Ah! Jibril! Jibril! I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he was so nice, you guys. He's like, I want to thank you for coming here to Riyadh and doing all of these shows. It was so beautiful to see everyone having such an amazing time from the little children in attendance all the way to the elderly people with a cane. Everyone had an amazing time, everyone. It was beautiful, okay, beautiful. Religious people <laughs> laughing, religious police laughing. They don't laugh at shit. <laughs> I want you to understand how big this is. There was an American here entertaining people from Middle East. There was no violence, no bloodshed, no problems. Everybody was smiling. Everybody was getting along. It is possible. An American was here. An American was here. He kept saying American, American, American. Freaking 10 years being called a Latino comic. I had to go all the way around the world to finally get called American. I was excited. I was like, say it again, American. <laughs> and then I had the most surreal conversation I have ever had with the person. He looks at me and he says, I want to thank you for everything. I want to invite you and your friends to come to my palace so that I may entertain you. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I am not getting invited to a palace by a prince. Oh my God, up until this point, my only experience with royalty was a Burger King drive through <laughs> All of a sudden, one of those SUVs pulls up and a guy jumps out in a suit. And I guess his favorite word was please, because that's all he said. Please, 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 please. I'm like, are you kidding me? There's a man in a suit trying to get me in the back of a Lincoln Navigator and there's a prince inviting me to his palace. I'm not gonna lie, I felt like a hot chick. I did. I was like, oh my God, let's go. <laughs> Hurry up, bitch, let's go. <laughs> we get to the front of his palace, you guys. I'm not gonna lie, it didn't look like a palace. The walls are really high. There's barbed wire around the entire property and there's two guys in the front with machine guns. I'm looking at this and I'm like, this doesn't look like a palace. <laughs> And I started thinking, what if I'm on some messed up episode of Middle Eastern punk? You know what I mean? Like, you thought you go to palace, you go to prison, you're punk! <laughs> Fortunately, the doors opened up and we drive in and then they closed and what we saw was amazing. Outside, desert. Inside, palm trees, bushes, shrubs, a pond, and he had exotic pets. I know exotic pets, because I know what I have. <laughs> Over there? He's got a tiger! Freaking zebra! Monkeys! And he had a freaking boa constrictor. I'm like, are you kidding me? Snakes, monkeys, a zebra, and a tiger? Oh my God, that makes me Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> and I started thinking, what if he decides to keep me? It sounds messed up, but let me explain. As an American, you cannot just purchase an airline ticket to go to Saudi Arabia. You have to be invited by a person of power. You know, when I left Detroit to go over there, I had to fill out a form that says, I understand that I'm going to Saudi Arabia. And should something happen to me, one of those things on the list being kidnapping, conveniently right above death, America is not responsible. The prince could have actually, you're mine. Two weeks later, now he's showing someone else around, right? That is my snake, that is my zebra, that is my Mexican, that is my tiger. He inside of some little box that says Jibril. But it never happened. And we're walking around, and I actually pulled him aside for a second. I said, listen, uh, I gotta tell you something. Well, you tell me. I, I need to apologize. What did you do? I didn't do anything. 
I just want to apologize for coming here with the wrong mentality. I says, unfortunately, I thought that uh, just, you know, because it is the Middle East, I thought you guys were going to be rude and everybody's been nothing but nice. Huh? I know. <laughs> I didn't think you guys were going to speak English so well and understand, you know, so many references and you guys get everything. Huh? I know. <laughs> I thought you guys were going to throw rocks, but you were funny. What? Never mind. <laughs> okay, two out of three, why aren't <laughs> So we're walking, and uh, he's showing me this and that, and we're just kind of like looking around. I thought it was great, and then I saw something that freaked me out. We're walking in the direction of a giant cage. And when I saw the cage, I stopped. I was like, ah! Uh, what's with the cage? Take a look. Great. <laughs> So I walk over towards the cage and I look inside and I notice that there's birds in there. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, it's a bird cage. And he got all offended, you know? That's not regular birds. Those are falcons. I go, okay, well, you have a lot of falcons. Uh, we'll use the falcons for hunting. You hunt falcons? No, 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 no. Each falcon is very expensive. 100,000 US dollars. They are trained. We go out and we shoot a little animal and we send a falcon to retreat. Would you like to see? No, 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 no. I got little dogs. I don't want to. <laughs> Before I know it, here comes the other guy. Please, please, please. And he goes inside the cage and he puts on this leather glove that comes up to his elbow and he starts getting one of the falcons. I'm watching him do this and I notice all the falcons are on these perches about this high and there's about 15 in a row and they all have hoods covering their eyes. And I asked them, why do they have hoods on their eyes, man? They look like little hostages. <laughs> Shit. I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry. I meant no disrespect by that, man. Seriously. No. No disrespect. I, it was a slip. And he was cool. I understand. Middle East hostage. <laughs> yeah, all right. So the other guy comes out and he's got a falcon with him and he's got a glove and he hands me the glove and I put it on and he transfers his falcon to my arm. And uh, all of a sudden, he starts doing snapping things, and he's basically showing me that the falcon's trained. And I thought that was great. I thought we were going to kill something. I'm like, no, but we were just playing with the falcon. And I started getting excited, you know? And the more excited I got, the more the prince started showing his age, because then he got excited. I'm like, this is great. It is great. Yes, this is so cool. So cool. Oh my God, you're so lucky to have so many falcons. I am so lucky. Would you like a falcon? So matter of fact, like, would you like a cookie? Would you like a falcon? Same way. I'm like, are you kidding me? Don't give me a falcon that can retrieve things. Shoo, you think I'm lazy now? <laughs> Hell no, don't give me a, uh, uh, uh. I wouldn't even leave the house. I'd be at the front door. <laughs> Donuts. <Yay! laughs> And who the hell is gonna watch my falcon when I'm up here performing? I can't leave it with my buddy Martin in the back. You know he would abuse it, take it to some nightclub, try to hook up with it, freaking. The redhead. <laughs> so you guys, I wanted to find um, a very special way to close out this event. And uh, I thought it would be great if I could tell an old story that was from years ago that never made it to a one hour special. And uh, the cool part about this story is that it, it now has a different ending. <laughs> the story is called The Gift Basket. Some of you know it, some of you don't know it, but after this, you're never gonna forget it. All you have to know about this story is that all the people involved have always been and will continue to be friends. That being said, Martin and I, <laughs> all the good ones start like that. Martin and I are scheduled to perform in Northern California. Usually we fly, but this particular day I was having a problem with Southwest Airlines. They wanted me to pay for an extra seat for someone who wasn't traveling with me. Take your time, you'll figure it out. <laughs> anyway, I tell Martin, I'm not paying for an extra seat. Let's just drive, it's six hours. 
So we headed north. Three hours into the drive, we're passing through a city called Fresno. And as we're passing, hey, Fresno 559, get us all Anyway, as we're passing through Fresno, we start seeing billboards off the side of the freeway that said, performing this weekend at the Radisson Hotel directly from BET's Comic View and Showtime at the Apollo, comedian G. Riley. And I look at Martina and go, oh shoot, G's in town. And Martina goes, yeah, I haven't seen G in years. So we're like, let's stop by the hotel and say hi. So we pull into the parking lot. We walk in. I tell Martin, he doesn't know we're here. I'm gonna crank call his room. He goes, what are you gonna say? I said, I'm gonna tell him that I'm the front desk and that he just received a gift basket. What's so funny about a gift basket? I said, I'm going to describe it over the phone. And I'm going to make all the items that are in this imaginary basket become items that stereotypically a black person might like. (laughs) You're crazy. I said, I'll tell you what, we got two hours to kill. How about this? How about we go to the supermarket and we make an actual racist gift basket. And we'll have it delivered and we'll wait outside to see what happens. I said, are you down? We go to a store and we start to design the sickest practical joke ever. I get a shopping cart and I'm like, all right, we need a basket. So I find one, I take out the grass, the plastic eggs, and the chocolate rabbits, and we start hitting the aisles. First item I grab is a fried chicken about that big, okay? See how quick that laugh was? (laughs) There's a few black people in here like, motherfucker, this better be funny. It's hysterical. Let me just finish the story and then you could judge me in the parking lot. So anyway, then Martin hands me a miniature watermelon and I put it next to the fried chicken. Here's where it gets interesting. Employees of the store find out what we're doing and they start volunteering to help us finish the basket. Half of the employees were black, which made it so much more accurate. Aisle after aisle, aisle. one guy was stocking a shelf. He was an older white guy, and we're like, sir, can you help us? What do you need? My buddy Martin and I are trying to make this messed up racist gift basket for our black friend as a practical joke. Can you think of something we can put in there? Without even blinking an eye, the guy was like, ah, you gotta have (laughs) Kool-Aid. It's at the end of the aisle on the right. Malt liquor's an XL lower in the back of the store in the freezer section. It's on sale two for one. By the time we get to the register, all these different employees plus us came up with the basket that had fried chicken, watermelon, Kool-Aid, grape soda, barbecue potato chips, sunflower seeds, an ebony magazine, a Chris Rock DVD called Bigger and Blacker, Magnum condoms, Newport cigarettes, a rack of ribs, the recipe for cornbread. It was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and figure icing on the cake we find a greeting card that's on clearance from Halloween and it has a picture of three ghosts on the cover wearing sheets I tear off the half that says happy Halloween and on the back of the card I write welcome to Fresno love the Chamber of Commerce and we stick it to the basket we made it all nice and pretty and we haul ass to the hotel we pull up We walk in, the basket is hot as hell, so I'm racing in. I get inside and I put it on the counter as fast as I can, bro. It's too perfect. There's a black girl behind the front desk. As soon as I put the basket down, I hear. Is that chicken? Ooh, let me see, hold on. (laughs) What is it? Let me explain. My name is Gabriel. This is Martin. We're a couple of comedians and we're about to play a really crazy practical joke on a friend of ours who's staying here tonight by the name of G. Riley, who's also a comedian. Oh, the one that's on the signs on the freeway. Yeah, the one that's on the signs on the freeway. So as a practical joke, we went to the store and we made this messed up racist gift basket. That's, that's why you can smell fried chicken. And she was like, what? You need Jesus, that's what you need. (laughs) Kiki, girl, you better hang up that phone. You ain't gonna believe what I'm looking at over here, girl. Listen, we think it would be hysterical if we could have you deliver the basket for us. She lost it. Oh, the hell you didn't. I know you didn't just ask me to take that to a black man. You are out your damn mind. Oh, Lord, Lord, give me the strength. 
to not kill this big ass Mexican over here, Lord. Mm-mm. Uh-uh. Okay, look here, Nacho Libre. I don't care who you are. I am not doing it. Hell no. I'll give you 50 bucks. Where that motherfucker at? We follow her to the hotel room. She knocks on the door. Martin and I hide by the elevator on the floor. She knocks. She opens the door, sees a beautiful black woman standing there with a gift basket. This is for you, baby. He says, thank you, closes the door. She walks away and she sees us on the ground hiding, right? And she's like, y'all still going to hell. <laughs> we get up and we walk over to the door and we put our ear, listen, shh, listen. This is what we hear inside. <laughs> Woo! Chicken. <laughs> oh, Kool-Aid. He's getting excited over every single item he's pulling out of the basket. He gets to the greeting card. What can a Fresno love the Chamber of Commerce? Hell yeah. Then we feel him flipping the card over because his voice changed. He's like, oh yeah, man. Is it, what the fuck? <laughs> Outside the door, we heard racist bastards. <laughs> when we heard racist bastards, we lost it. Housekeeping is freaking out. ¿Qué está pasando allá? ¿Qué andan haciendo ustedes? Muchachos, ¿qué está pasando, gordito? ¿Qué andas haciendo? We're laughing, we're crying, we got boogers coming out. We can't take it anymore. We knock on the door. He yells, who is it? <laughs> Too easy. Chamber of Commerce. He rushes the door. I put my finger on the peephole so we can't see who it is, right? The knob starts to jiggle, then the door explodes open, and he's like, what? And he sees us, and he's like, ah! What's up, G? Man, y'all give a brother a heart attack. Did you like your basket? Man, that was messed up. Did you like it? Man, I love all that shit. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a story that has been seven years in the making. I would like for you to now hear, for the first time ever, the other side of that story. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I flew him here to Hawaii so that he can share this with you. Give it up for my friend, Mr. G. Right? I gotta be honest, I didn't know it was racist. I thought it was lunch. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was lunch. I didn't know it was racist until I got back to my neighborhood and the brothers in my neighborhood looked at me. They say, man, I, I don't believe you let that Mexican guy do that to you, man. That was messed up. I know you got him back. I said, what, buy him lunch? I can't afford to buy that man lunch. If I, if I buy him lunch, he'll be getting me again. But see, you gotta understand, it was the perfect set of circumstances when it happened. Because I'm laying across the bed in the hotel. I had never been to Fresno before. And I wanted something to eat, and I didn't know where to go eat. So I'm laying across the bed, and I'm saying to myself, where could I go eat? I wish I had some food. And all of a sudden, magically, there's a knock on the door, and a black girl shows up with a gift basket. And I took the gift basket, and I said, they know how to treat their comedians up here in Fresno. <laughs> and I'm walking to the bed, and I can feel the heat and I could smell the chicken from the gift basket. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. Cause nobody smells chicken and thinks of racism, right? Right, so I see the watermelon. I'm like, oh, this is cool. They know how to treat a comedian up in here. I get to the card and I look at the card and I go, what the fuck is going on? I said, oh my God, I'm working for the Ku Klux Klan. I really, I really started to panic. 
panic because in my head, I'm saying to myself, is this for real? Because there were billboards all over the city with my picture. And I started thinking they were trying to scare me out of town. <laughs> so now I don't know what to do, right? And I start trying to call a promoter and the promoter's not answering the phone and it's festering in my head and I'm nervous and I'm pacing the room and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door, right? And I go, oh my God, they come to get me. So I ease over to the door, right? And I look through the peephole, right? And all I see is a brown dot, right? And I go, I, I hear somebody out there because I hear the breathing, right? I hear Because <laughs> this was about 60 pounds ago, right? I, <laughs> so I go to look down up under the door, right? And I say, oh my God, it got to be about five or six of them out there. Oh my God. So I figure like this. I figure, okay, you know what? If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. You know, if it's gonna happen, I'ma go down swinging, right? So I put my best black face on. You know, I, I tried to look mean, you know? I look, I look like this guy right here. I look like that guy right there, right? And I go, who is it? And they go, Chamber of Commerce. And I'm like, oh my God, the Chamber of Commerce is the Ku Klux Klan. And I'm panicking, so I get to the door, right? and I pull the, open, the door open, and when the door opens up, these guys are falling all over the hall laughing at me. They're rolling all into the cleaning lady's car. The cleaning lady didn't know what was going on, right? She's scared to death because she sees a black dude with no shirt like this, so she grabs the lemon pledge like it's pepper spray, right? She's ready to get... <laughs> so everything, now that I realize it's a practical joke, Everything calms down, because I remember that I remember how hungry I was. I'm like, okay, cool. Practical joke, right? So I go in the bathroom to wash my hands. While I'm in the bathroom washing my hands, I hear a commotion in the other room, right? I go back in the other room. They're going through the gift basket. The maid is leaving with the watermelon. Martina's drinking my 40, and this fucking bastard is eating my chicken! Mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much.